Zen at the Sharp End. Welcome to the podcast about how to turn difficult people and relationships into your best teachers. I'm Mark West Maquette, a Zen Buddhist teacher, mindfulness teacher, and ex professional astronomer. This is a podcast to go along with my latest book, Zen and the Art of Dealing with Difficult People, which is out now and available to order in all the usual places. In each episode, we'll be exploring different varieties of people, relationships and situations that we find irritating, difficult or painful. Together with a number of Zen friends, I'll be discussing how the practices of Buddhism and mindfulness can help us see our difficult people as troublesome Buddhas, our greatest teachers. This podcast is sponsored by Zen Minded an online lifestyle store offering you the very best in Japanese craft, incense, and other Zen-inspired home goods. Check it out at www.zenminded.uk. Ah, well, hello, Jason, and to welcome on to the podcast today. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be here. (laughs) So I wonder if perhaps we could start by you talking to us a little bit about how you got into Zen, your background, you know, and in Zen practice and, and some of your journey so far. Mm, sure. Well, um, it must have been about 10 years ago when I was having some psychotherapy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the work has sort of involved me writing some letters to and from myself. And uh, I was very surprised to find that uh, I encountered some some peace in that stillness, which uh, I I hadn't um, encountered quite like that before. Uh, I'd I'd Mm. always sort of dreaded my own company. Mm. And that sort of began a a bit of curiosity about um, mindfulness. Um, So I went on an eight-week mindfulness course, uh, which was a real game changer for me, actually. Mm. Um, and um, that, uh, following following that, I started sitting with a little group uh, near where I lived. Um, so, is that in London? Is it? So that was in in uh, yes, uh, Dalston, so, so North East yeah. London. Um, and um, then I. Um, uh, what happened next? I discovered there was a Christian minister who was um, running Zen meditation sessions in a church. Wow! Um, in in North London, and that that really uh, attracted me because I have quite a long history of of going to church, uh, a church mm-hmm. of India background, and my sense was that when I meditate, it was a bit like prayer, uh, and so starting to go to zen sessions in a church felt like bringing bringing different worlds together for me the world of therapy and and my spiritual background mm. and and what was his background how did he come across zen do you know so she um oh she sorry yeah um so i don't quite recall uh, i mean she was um her teacher was a chap called Jeff Shaw, who I think I think we've spoken about before. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and she'd been running this group for a few years, uh, and was quite interested in the in the bridge between Christianity and Zen. Uh, fascinating. Um, so that was about eight years ago. Uh, following that, I, I was a sort of little and often meditator. Uh, didn't really think about going on retreats or anything. Um, but as I, my practice developed, I, I, my curiosity was piqued a bit and I, I looked around for, uh, retreat options and I, I saw that, uh, uh, a, a man called Daisan was running a, a session, a day retreat, um, down in Camberwell with the title, um, if we're all something, something like if we're all Buddhas in the first place, then there's no need to try to become a Buddha or something. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And as I spent much of my life really, really, really trying at things, that was 
a sort of a breath of fresh air. So that was the first time you met Dyson and encountered Zenways. Uh, it was, uh, and I came came down uh, probably about eight years ago. Felt a deep sense that um, I could trust the the teaching, the teacher, and um, uh, it's been my meditation home since then. And and do you carry on going to that place with the the, the priest? Um, so she's no longer a minister there. But um, mm. she and her group do run one-day uh, meditation retreats. It's varied quite a bit, obviously, with the pandemic. But uh, I, I like to touch base with them and occasionally go and do a day sitting with them. So, yes, occasionally yeah. I, I, I keep up the connection. I mean, I, w- I wonder if perhaps you'd be willing to to say a few words on your perspective just before we get into the the rest of our subject today, but just just on your perspective of the of the bridge between Zen and Christianity and how you found that for yourself. I think that's a fascinating area. Mm. Yes. Um, well, um, I suppose it comes from the experience, um, uh, the experience of prayer, and um, uh, so, I mean, prayer, you know, prayer can take all sorts of forms, but um, it can take the form of sort of putting aside your wishes and wants and just sitting, um, mm. maybe laying bare your, um, your concerns, uh, maybe praying for other people, but also just being in the presence uh, of uh, yeah. of God as you uh, as you see that um, and when I sat meditating I thought well this isn't anything different I mean, we can dress yeah. it up how we like and we can pin all kinds of philosophical ideas to it but the actual experience of, of, of is one of surrender um, uh, and for, for me anyway it it um, it, it occurred to me that although so many people argue the difference, uh, it, for me it was it was, it was no different. Mm, mm. Do you remember the first time you came across the sort of concept of um, uh, a troublesome Buddha, a p- person mm. who's a difficult person who can be a, a somewhat a teacher towards you? Mm. So I think um, what well, the the phrase Buddhas appear troublesomely. Um, that I remember hearing that phrase um, some years ago, mm. and it, it resonated with me um, more in a general sense that that the peace and clarity of Buddha only a- appears to me when I when I'm when I face my distress, or it particularly appears to me after I face uh, uh, whatever is coming up for me. Um, so I mean, classically, you know, on a on a retreat, the first for me anyway, the first forty eight hours can be really rather difficult, and mm. sort of walking like walking through mud. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not just you, Jason. <laughs> well, I was about to say this <laughs> truth for everyone, but <laughs> maybe there's some people. Anyway, okay, let's say it's all of us. But um, and then come day three or four, often things there's a there's a sort of a peace and a clarity and a, a, a sort of rightness that starts to appear. Um, mm. So um, I guess I didn't pin it to people being troublesome Buddhas per se, um, but just um, that Buddha appears when you know Buddha brings up our stuff, basically. Mm. So B- Buddha in a more general sense mm. of like our experience of this, like Buddha nature kind of thing. Mm. Mm. And I suppose I wonder whether Buddha <laughs> itself, himself, is the trouble. It's just, like, it's just, he shows up our trouble or, you know. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> like brings us face to face with mm. stuff, basically, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So then people themselves like difficult people and difficult relationships 
I mean, uh, did that kind of come into focus slowly or did so a particular example or two just kind of rise up in your life or? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I have people who, um, who sort of just like everybody else, I have people who I find difficult uh, and I've had um, relationships um, um, which are difficult and uh, I've got obviously got some examples in a minute uh, and uh, from family and the difficulty um, starts to show something about myself or oneself. Mm. So mm. uh, years before I would ever consider myself doing a sort of a Buddhist practice, uh, there was this sense that people could show you, um, show me where I'm uh, sort of avoiding or being defensive or where I'm fearful. Okay, so maybe should we should we discuss a, a couple of the, the examples then that you've yeah you, you were thinking about? I mean, um... yeah, I mean, I think um, family, family and friends um, come to mind. Um, mm. as being uh, as being teachers for me so um yeah i mean i i was the youngest of four kids um and um uh there was in my early years that there was a growing sense that i couldn't really keep up with the other three and i felt mm. sort of rather unseen um and um my my own sort of trouble troubles seem to be seem now to be related to being sent to boarding school aged seven um and my sense of it is that um the sort of parents i imagined i had um sort of passed away then and the the, the people who picked me up a couple of weeks after boarding school start were sort of felt like foster parents they weren't mm. completely different from what i the types of people I thought were my parents. Um, and and clearly there was a sort of bereavement there. Um, and that happened every time or just the first time you, um, went, you went to boarding school, sorry? So there's just this picture I have of... Uh, no, it, it, was it every time? I think uh, it, it's... Um, you get... You adapt to the new program. Um, so over time, uh, I, I learned to bury the hope of, mm. of, um, uh, of, of, of the parents that I had and the, the image of myself. And there wasn't really any, you know, I was a, a seven year old. It's not some, that's, there was no sort of encouragement to process a wound. Right. Right. Um, so uh, it's the, the techniques uh, then, then, and maybe now a sort of distraction with with sort of good things. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's clear; it's very clear to me that there was a, a, a bitterness got embedded then, and uh, I think it must have been about a decade that I, I couldn't really. When my mum came to hug me, I would I would freeze. Um, until I until I learned to fake it and and sort of just do sort of um, do you know uh, replicate her what she's doing to me, mm. um, but um, yes, my family became like a sort of formal institution. Um, I did what had to be done, uh, but I didn't feel close to anyone except my brother, who's two years older than me. Um, so that that was the sort of something that happened to me. Um, my school friends became my sort of replacement family, and this isn't something I started really to unpack until my my thirties, actually. And that's that's when that sort of the sort of some some learning and insight started to happen uh, when I started have, having some psychotherapy. So um, yes. Um, having some psychotherapy helped me realize that there was a grieving in me still a hidden grieving yes behind a sort of a disconnection with my life um 
so um, yes, there was a sort of hurt seven-year-old within me, uh, and that mm. sort of um, that brought about a, a slightly agonising phase of me trying to repair that wound with my parents who were now in their sort of 70s Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, for a while I would meet up with them and sort of have a rather desperate hope that we could uh, sort of heal an old wound Mm. Um, but they were in their 70s and uh, uh, it's um, my mum was quite keen to sort of meet up and we had some uh, uh, quite a few lunches during this phase my my sort of dad was uh, not terribly enthusiastic about this this um, <laughs> this this path of yeah. digging up the past or as he would say um so uh but yes i was sort of still in a kind of emotional dependency i remember meeting up with my dad once really 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 hoping that a, a chink of healing could ha- happen and this is me in my mm. you know late 30s and my dad in his 70s um fortunately with a bit more time, uh, another sort of game changer time was realizing it, that actually I don't need them to recognize what happened. Um, uh, simply by bringing a conscious awareness to an old wound, um, led led by hand by my therapist to begin with, but um, bringing my own conscious awareness to this wound actually softened things and was. That's that's where the that's the healing that needed to happen, mm. um, and the discovery that it wasn't so much what my parents actually did; it was what I did to myself in the mm. face of those events. So that was my sort of journey of healing up until mindfulness, um, and then the mindfulness. Um, I can I can remember the the exact moment in the room where for the first time I discovered that all these storylines of 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 hurt had a could be felt in the body in my head uh, mm. in the center of my head and mm. as my awareness came to the center of my head all the stories disappeared um so, um, uh, and what what was that moment like? Where where were you at that moment? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I was sat at my desk, my desk in a clinic, uh, at the end of a session, and um, just sort of applying a bit of sort of beginner's mindfulness. And there was a moment where my mind was in sort of stories, and the stories suddenly went, and for the, I felt this strange sensation right in the bang in the middle of my head uh and i put my awareness on that and suddenly i noticed there was nothing else going on huh and it was like and it was there was actually although it's a slightly uncomfortable sensation there was there was peace um in my experience apart from that comfortable i'm slightly uncomfortable (laughs) sensation Mm. Mm. And that that uh, that that uh, state of mind had had never been experienced by me before. Okay, okay, mm. just just that that sort of one time. Mm. And it occurred to me, well, hang on a sec. This this whole healing project could become quite simple if I, you know, I don't need to sort of intellectualize it. I don't need to even understand it. Uh, right thoughts. It could just be. Um, it could just be felt. So I sort of went back to my therapist and thought, well, may- maybe I don't need you anymore. <laughs> 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 he va- he vaguely agreed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a. I mean, it's an amazing, such a direct example of how we can drop out of the storylines. Uh, of the the kind of thought world and enter into the the body sensation world and how you know the two are, are very inextricably linked but also 
are kind of like two sides of the coin where we can we can either be very caught up in thoughts or we can be completely in the present moment here and now experience of our of our sensations mm. yeah um so i mean of course thoughts came back <laughs> mm. yeah. um, but i i never f- forget forgot this this possibility and and, and mm. started to to work with it and, and how how has the working with it sort of evolved well i mean i still get that <laughs> that sensation in my head every day so it's something that's been with me for since that moment so, uh, huh. so it just kind of arose in that moment and then has been with you since yes i mean i can mm. yeah, i can feel it now if, if i mm. you know if i take the moment a, a split second to to go within yeah um and it's my it's it's i guess it's my it's my teacher so how has it been since then um uh yeah i mean life happens and brings with it new challenges uh but i tend to all my difficulty can still be located in that part of my head Mm. Um, uh, yes, so eight eight years of pretty pretty steady practice. Um, um, so, uh, and how do you practice with something that's so visceral and um, sort of very like it has a very distinct epicenter, you know, in your body and things? What what what's your practice look like? Well, yeah, I th- I as, a, as you asked me, I guess. Weather, stormy weather. Mm. <laughs> not not the sort of weather of the Sahara, sunny. <laughs> more like a sort of um, maybe more sort of on Cape Horn or something. I mean, <laughs> right now I'm you know I'm 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 relaxed. I'm fairly stable and happy. Last night I was sort of uh, lying on the floor, floor with this. <laughs> this sensation in my head sort of nine out of ten literally right. um, literally i made myself a hot chocolate for comfort but i couldn't bring myself to drink it there was a gale going on inside me oh, right. and i had stomach pain and i was lying it was work-related stress um work is quite difficult for me at the moment but um and it, uh, you know it was it was awfully challenging um uh for a period of time and then today (laughs) it's um it's a very different mental state i'm in so it varies enormously Mm. and and you just sort of let the storm sort of rage on and then pass by is it or uh yes uh i mean when you're in the storm there are all sorts of sort of thoughts uh about how this is terrible, this shouldn't be happening, and sort of uh, all kinds of fix-it uh, ideas coming up. Um, and I suppose I've become a little bit better at just lying on the floor and not entertaining any of those, mm. and just letting it, um, just letting it almost sort of take me over. Sort of, or I, sometimes I mutter the phrase, sort of, you know, destroy me if you will, and and, <laughs> and then right. it usually calms down. <laughs> but, okay, but it's a sort of, if it's really really strong, it's like um, just you know, just do do your worst, and, like surrender to it. Uh, yes, um, as in come upon me, you know. Is in a sense give up. I give up the fight, mm. uh, and and let it consume me. But oddly enough, it. I mean, it never does. Uh, it. Mm. Uh, it. Um, it just uh, settles down. I mean, so you being able to say that would indicate to me or, or would suggest to me perhaps a long sort of journey that you've had to get to that point. I mean, I would suspect that not many, many people would be comfortable 
with just when things get that intense inside their body to just surrender to it and let it let it take them because a lot of people are extremely fearful about what might happen if, if they do that and so i mean there must have been see has there been a bit of a journey in terms of going to that point um there i mean that there, there there has um i think um um so going on retreats can help i think well for me i've uh i've been in this place on on a on a number well two or three retreats and it's an opportunity you know you're in safe company um you're not having to sort of uh you know you're not at work you're you're really just devoted to the inner process and yeah. that's a good practice ground to when things get really tough to to experiment with this mm, mm, um, that kind of like dedicated time where there's no other stuff going on we can just really yes. focus on being with it yeah yes mm. uh, i mean the, the pain happen the pain happens when we really try and resist this or, or kind of fix it or change it or you know and and I can I can remember my I think my first session where there was a real sense of me sort of losing my ground and me trying to sort of choose a different technique to try and mm. <laughs> get out of this mindset and then suddenly mm. it dawned on me I'm going to lose this battle <laughs> oh my god I'm going to lose this battle and then I lose the battle I've got nothing else in my toolkit surrender. And suddenly, you know, not long, it's all okay. The storm's gone. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, well, yeah. hang on a sec. Why didn't I give up earlier? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the, the pain comes from sort of flailing around mm. sort of ineffectively. <laughs> um so you you said how this has been your teacher, you know, and, and just kind of bringing it back around to you know, thinking of your relationship with your parents and and you said your brother and things like that. You know, how, how has it how has it sort of shown you things as you've been with this this kind of center of your head stuff? So, um, well, um, so. What I discovered was that I could be with my parents and um, uh, experience this sensation in the center of my head. Uh, and it would come up quite strongly and I could just let it do it. And um, then I could after I'm with my parents, I could sit in a park or or basically create a little space for recovery where mm. um, the, the parts of me that were triggered by being with my parents again um, could uh, be allowed to come up, be experienced, be met, and um, to some extent, um, let go of. Um, and so yeah and and not much else needs needs to be done to sort of go on the hidden mm. path i discovered so mm. i had this sort of sort of curious sort of inner smile thinking hang on a second i don't need to even get them on the same page i just need to i can just be in them with, with my parents not even talk about stuff it gets triggered, but there's a space to to welcome it into consciousness and then mm. be freed of it to a little bit mm. each time. So is that a little bit like, I mean, Daizen always talks about how, you know, meditation practice, it's a bit like taking out the rubbish. You know, we let all this stuff just churn around and it sort of dissipates a bit just by letting it come and not trying to do anything about it, not trying to manipulate it. It just sort of dissolves by itself. Is it a little bit like that? Uh, yes, um, yes, not trying to manipulate it, just letting it be there mm. and almost sitting in your awareness, sitting close to it. 
Mm. Um, and then once once one starts to notice the benefit of that, um, you know, relationship to difficult circumstances changes. So, I mean, I, I dreaded Christmases. I mean, they were awful, but there was a loneliness. I would leave the Christmas year feeling lonely. Mm. Um, but once one sort of starts getting familiar with this practice, um, you can... Once you start to notice the fruit that, that's being the bad, bad fruit from this, mm. you know, I didn't, you know, Christmases became a, a time of, okay, I'll feel lonely. And then the part of me that's lonely can be met, felt, and, and, um, and healed. So mm. <laughs> mm. I began to be quite curious and, and quite happy about family times at christmas and i yeah started to enjoy them just through the power of allowing things to be felt and as you say like met in a way that's not manipulative Hmm. yes uh and as one well in my experience as i do that i mean the painful moments of my childhood come up to my mind uh and then they are let go of. And it's like bit by bit, that young child is sort of swept up in the loving arms of awareness. And then, then he's kind of gone. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's strange. Actual pain, particular memories come up to you, to my mind. And then you think, okay, that was a time of, of isolation that hour, that day, whatever. And it's almost like, that time whenever it was actually i wasn't alone this this <laughs> this awareness that's with me now working on it was there then it just mm. i didn't know it <laughs> yeah 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 so, oh that's so lovely that's, yeah there's a sense yeah. that actually we discover that we were never truly alone i mean we didn't know it so we it, 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 we so we suffered at the time but when mm. we do this practice it's like the 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 present moment awareness now swoops back in time and and um kind of uh nurtures that part that didn't know that there was such a thing i mean in a sense i mean i suppose in a sense it's like swoops back in time but that part of us i mean it, what it feels like to me for myself is that that part of us is basically still existing here in the present moment like it has not been allowed to sort of grow up or like for, for me, that's what I feel like it wasn't allowed to grow up. It wasn't allowed to sort of, um, you know, resolve. So it stayed, you know, with me and uh, up until my adulthood. So it it's felt like you swoop back into time. But actually, it's like just present moment. Here's part of me now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, also for myself, I spent some years doing psychotherapy. So I'm kind of interested to, to hear what's your perspective on, you know, was that just something that got the ball rolling or has it given you certain skills which you feel like you still bring to bear in your practice now? Or or do you feel like it was important at a certain phase and then it then it then it became not necessary? Or, you know, what how do you relate the mindfulness and the Zen to the psychotherapy? Hmm. I mean, when I did psychotherapy, I wouldn't have been open to doing meditation. Mm. So it was, I mean, I was a bit daunted by doing uh, psychotherapy. But um, then, um, uh, and I did it and I, and I started to notice the benefits. Um, my feeling uh then as i took up mindfulness was it's doing the same thing so it's mm. the, what do i mean i mean that uh bringing awareness to um uh, our, our let's say our fixations our wounds um uh 
that which brings our own conscious awareness to our wounds uh, is liberating. Um, and that might be with the skillful guidance of a psychotherapist, um, mm. or it might be um, through a sort of somatic practice where you're experiencing it in the body. Mm. Um, with psychotherapy, it would have to be a, a form of psychotherapy that's sort of simply open and looking, isn't trying to sort of, um, you know, some psychotherapy is sort of solution focused. So it's right, right, it's, right. It's not yeah. sort of, um, it, it, it's not quite so open. It's got a, a particular agenda. Yeah, exactly. Mm, mm. Not all psychotherapy is is uh, similar like that. Mm. So uh, perhaps one last question. Um, so this sense that you have in the middle of your head, in that we've been talking about this feeling, how, how would you relate that to the Buddha? Or how do you see that in relation to Buddha nature? Or like, because we're talking about troublesome Buddhas. Um, so, um, I mean, it's it, it's my sense of it myself is that uh, if if I practice with my if, or whenever I practice, really two things are happening in my experience. There's the experience of the physical sensation, which is my um, my troublesomeness, and there is that around it, which is Buddha. Um, that's when it's you know happening cleanly the process and I'm obviously there's quite a lot of thoughts that come through and uh, uh, and and I get taken off to some degree by them um, so the, the, the troublesomeness is the is the thinking and the the physical residue um, and the Buddha bit is that around it. Well, I mean, I, I really could, we could carry on talking. I've got to, you know, I could think of many directions and things I'd love to talk to you about. Uh, I suspect we're going to need to uh, just <laughs> wrap it up at this point. <laughs> I mean, thank you so much, Jason. It's been absolutely fascinating as, and, and, and for being willing to be so honest and bring all those things, you know, to talk about today. I really, really, really appreciate it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, maybe I could just add one last thing. Sure, sure, yeah. Is that there's a, um, there's a there's a definite sense that this the, the the physical thing in me that sort of experience of pain isn't just isn't just mine, you know. Mm. It's it's a suffering that's intimately connected with that which my mum has struggled with. Um, my dad has struggled with some family trends, even Britishness, British stiff upper lipness. Right. Um, uh, it's almost like, you know, that my suffering is not just my suffering. Uh, but the flip side of the coin is my joy is not really, is not just my joy either. Mm. Uh, there's a sense that uh, it's a joy shared by all. So um, that's a sort of something that. Uh, I've had glimpses of on, a, for example, the compassion retreat. Um, yeah. And uh, occasionally I get this glimpse and it's lovely to be reminded that the sense that at the end of it all, there's only one joy, uh, there's one suffering and the joy is shared by all the suffering. Is shared mm. by all. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What a lovely place to finish. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mark. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review and a star rating on whatever platform you use. And do recommend it to others, because we all have difficult people in our lives, and each of them offers us a real opportunity for learning and growth. For more information about my book and what else I offer, head over to my website, markwestmaquette.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. Bye for now.